have a chance to see it on our website. And it's a wonderful thing that sometimes people who aren't able to join us in person on Sunday mornings are able to join us here. And that includes people from far, far away who have been part of our congregation in the past. So it's really a reunion of sorts every Sunday morning when we come back together. To improve the quality of sound, all of you have been put on mute. And you'll keep your microphones on mute except maybe during Joys and Sorrows and after the service during coffee hour or the music feedback session. I have a couple of announcements. One is that our virtual lunches every Thursday from noon to one continue. So that's a wonderful opportunity to just hang out together and socialize. Also, after today's service, we will have a talk back, which is a time when people can give feedback, looking back at last year's music, and then brainstorm about what our music will look like going forward. During this time of virtual services, we found that music doesn't work when it's live. And so you'll notice that all our music today will be recorded. But one of these days, we'll be back in our sanctuary and back having the gift of live music. And so all of you have an opportunity to give your input on how things went this past year and what next year might look like. And then very important is that next week, after the service on May 3rd, is our spring congregational meeting. For the first time, we will be holding it on Zoom. And this is an important meeting. It's a time when we'll elect our leaders for the 2020 2021 church year that begins on July 1st. We'll also approve the budget and then have an opportunity to hear from me as your minister and also all the elected bodies, the Board of Trustees, the Committee on Shared Ministry and Leadership Development. So please plan to attend after the service next Sunday, May 3rd. And now I would like to introduce our prelude, which will be by Becky Reardon. She is a composer and singer from New Mexico. Some of you, if you've ever heard any Charlie Brown specials, may have heard her voice because she's the one who sang, Why Charlie Brown, Why? in one of the Peanuts specials. And in fact, Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, called Becky Reardon his favorite singer. And so the song you're about to hear is from her CD called Songs for a Walk. The sun comes up every morning and gives it away. The stars come out every evening and give it away. And freely falling, <laughs> falling down, the falling rains refresh the ground flow. Let it flow back, back around, flow, let it flow back around. The sun comes up every morning and gives it away. The stars comes out every evening and gives it away. Let it flow back around 
one hour spirit of life we let go for this one hour may we let go of our anxieties our fears our anger our self-doubts our regrets our petty grievances and our distractions for only this one hour let the flame of this chalice burn them from our hearts and minds and light our way to peace and serenity for this one holy hour. Come, let us worship together. And now we'll have our opening song, Spirit of Life. take time for, to recite our congregational affirmation. 
Love is the spirit of this church and service is its call. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. A few months ago in my column called The Minister's Musings, I wrote about a practice called living by heart. And it is when you take time to memorize poetry. And I don't know if you know that April is National Poetry Month. And in fact, this afternoon at one o'clock, there will be a virtual poetry reading by our Loveland Poet Laureate, Veronica Patterson. So on Zoom or Facebook at one o'clock, you can join her for a thousand blended notes. And the poem that I'm memorizing right now is one by David White. It is called Coleman's Bed. And so here's one of the stanzas that I'm working on. See with every turning day how each season wants to make a child of you again. Wants you to become a seeker after rainfall and bird song. Watch now how it weathers you to a testing in the tried and true. Tells you with each falling leaf to leave and slip away, even from that branch that held you. To go when you need to, to be courageous, to be like that last word you'd want to say before you leave this world. So I invite you now to sit back and relax in your chair or your couch. Maybe you would like to close your eyes and let's just enjoy in this crazy time a moment of silence. And then I will read to you one of my favorite poems. It's called First Lesson by Philip Booth. And what I've done is changed one word, which is daughter, and changed it to child. Let's begin our silence breathing together. Lie back, child. Let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand, gently, and I will hold you. Spread your arms wide, lie out on the stream and look high at the gulls. A dead man's float is face down. You will dive and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Child, believe me, when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. As you float now where I held you and let go, remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you. Lie gently and wide to the light year stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. Lie back, child, and the sea will hold you. And now for our time for all ages, how to catch a monkey. 
There's a well-known trap used by hunters to catch monkeys. What they do is they take a coconut, they cut a hole inside the coconut, empty it out, they make the hole just big enough so that the open hand of the monkey can fit in the hole, but the fist cannot. They put some kind of bait, like fruit, inside the coconut to lure the monkey in. They tie the coconut to a tree and then they wait. What they found is that monkeys are greedy. The monkey sticks his little hand inside the coconut to try to pull the fruit out, but can't get it out. And when the hunter approaches, they try even harder to try to pull the fruit out, but they can't do it. And then the monkey gets captured. All that monkey had to do was open his hand, let go of the fruit, and it would have been free. But his greed blinds him. His attachment to the prize is so strong that he sacrifices his life for it. Tch, silly monkeys, right? Mm, maybe not. What is your coconut? What are you holding on to that is trapping you? And if you could just let go, you would be free. Could it be money? Could it be your ideas about happiness that you're holding tightly to? And if only you just let go, then you could truly experience Happiness. Could it be your anger? If you forgave that person and let go of your judgment, then you could be free. Or maybe you have an idea in your mind of what your perfect partner looks, acts, and smells like, and that is trapping you. And if you could just let go of the idea, then you would be free to see what might be right under your nose. No matter what the attachment is, isn't it time to let go? Do not sacrifice your happiness, your peace, your life for man's version of a coconut, unless you just like being a monkey. Peace. All right, now I'm about to eat this. Together we weave a tapestry of love we call community in so many ways. And one of the ways is that we take time to share our joys and sorrows. So in our tradition at Namakwa, we transfer one of these glass pebbles into our blue bow that represents the embrace of our community. And so we'll take some time for some of you to share verbally and others of you to share by typing into the chat room your joys and sorrows. If you want to do the chat room, you can go down with your cursor to the bottom and if you'd like me to call on you, either raise your hand or put your name into your chat and we'll take some time to celebrate with you if you're sharing a joy and to offer you comfort if you have a sorrow. And I'd like to begin with a kind of combination joy and sorrow, which is that today is Ginny Weigel's 80th birthday. So we celebrate Ginny, your birthday, and that's a big one, 80th. But the sorrow is that Ginny has been ill for a number of years, so some of you who are new may not even know her. Kent Robertson is her husband, and he often updates us on how she's doing and thanks us for our prayers and the cards that we sing, I mean, that we send to her. But it is a sorrow that she has not been able to be with us physically. So I'll put in a pebble to celebrate Ginny's birthday. And so now I will call on Norma. So if you would want to unmute your mic and then briefly please share your joy or sorrow with us. Or did you have one or you just were saying that you liked the monkey message? <laughs> okay, all right. How about Joseph Flanagan and Deborah have an anniversary today? So which anniversary is it? Today is our 22nd. Your 22nd anniversary. Well, we celebrate with you. Happy anniversary, Deborah and Joseph. Thank you very much. We got married on his parents' 50th wedding anniversary. So it's Whoa. special every year for us. So this is what they would have been 70, 72. 72 years married today. So April 26th. And I know yesterday, Sarah and Don Suriani celebrated their anniversary, which also happens to be Lizzie's birthday. So for those of you who were with us last week, you got a chance to see one of our artists blossom and show us her art show that she showed when she was in Thailand. 
So who else would like to share? Susan? Um, it was my birthday last Tuesday. And I would, well, only, I would only say this to these people here because I know they won't tell anyone else. I'm 74 years old. <laughs> 74. 74, yeah. Hmm. Wow, and so Wednesday is when Francie Leifert and Tim Black turned 70. Oh, we have a bunch of Tauruses here, very bullheaded people, I think. <laughs> I guess also so. creative. creative. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Sasha, did you want to say something? If you do, unmute your button. Lost the picture. You can talk you're unmuted. You can talk, Sasha. And I got a puppy. You got a puppy? Well, that's definitely a joy. And what's your puppy's name? Maya. What is it? Maya. Maya. Maya? All right. Well, congratulations. And who else? See, I don't have, uh, I'm flipping through the screens and seeing more beloved faces. Anybody else? I think Mim oh, has. Mm -hmm. Mim. My wrist is almost completely healed and I am able to drive my own car again. Yay. Yay. Anybody else? And thank you for those of you who are helping me see people raising their hands that I can't see. Well, I'm gonna put in a whole bunch more. I know there are probably joys and sorrows that some of you are here have and also there's part of our community who's not with us and so for that oh everybody wants to see your puppy Sasha and so let me also call attention to these two candles lit behind me because we always like to take time to celebrate the joys beyond our walls and also to acknowledge the suffering so can you hear me? I just got a note that my speaker might be out. Oh, Vicki Clark had a birthday too. All right, so let's take a moment of silence in gratitude for the community that we are a part of, that makes our celebrations even more special and that does offer us some comfort when our hearts are broken. And now please join in singing our musical response to Joys and Sorrows Comfortably. Thank you. 
My reflection is called The Illusion of Control. The world we live in seems to be constantly surprising us lately. We've seen surprises that make us smile and shake our heads. The spring weather this last couple of months is an example. We've had one storm after another with warm and sunny days thrown in just enough to confuse Mother Nature and leave our spring flowers as unwitting victims. These are indeed inconvenient changes, but not that unusual. We used, we're very used to our Colorado weather and know how to go with the flow. Then there is the coronavirus pandemic, an unwelcome surprise that has essentially changed our way of life. Our pandemic rules in Colorado are clear. Governor Polis enacted a stay at home order until April 26th which only allows essential businesses to stay open. We know we aren't in control right now, but I'm not really sure who really is. We all feel in limbo without a sense of what the world will be like after this is all over. This change is inconvenient for some, but potentially devastating for others. These economic health and economic concerns are troubling for us right now. Then there is the bombast of the daily news feed. Politics is a part of every message we get from the government. We feel we must fact check everything and have little trust in what is being said. It is obviously we can't, obvious we can't control our life. Uncertainty, ambiguity, and instability seem to be all around us. In mulling all of this over, I have come to a realization. It's just like the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, change is the only constant in life. Surprisingly, I found this somehow comforting. <laughs> Trying to control what is inevitable makes me angry, fearful, and resentful. It is foolish in the final analysis. Uncertainty, Ambiguity and inconstancy, alas, have always been the soup in which we have lived. If we accept that control of life is really an illusion, we are freed up to live in the moment. By giving up control, we begin to know the importance of remaining connected. Staying connected is within our control, and forming alliances helps us cope with change. We are communal creatures who are part of the interconnected web of life. Dr. Brene Brown says in The Gifts of Imperfection, I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Courage starts with showing up and letting ourselves be seen. This strange new deadly virus has laid bare our vulnerability and need for staying in authentic connection with one another. I said that wrong. <laughs> this strange new deadly virus has laid bare our vulnerability 
and our need for staying in authentic connection with one, one another. However, the present divisive political climate has divided us. In the world in general, we have lost the sense of trust so necessary for personal connection. However, those family and friends that we trust have become closer and we've depended on each other a lot recently. We've helped one another because we empathize with each other's situation. So, if we have no control and we have trouble trusting because so many people have lied to us, how do we move forward? How do we do that? I'd like to use the analogy of a boat on the wild river of life. When we acknowledge that we don't have control, we allow ourselves to feel the river of life carrying us, taking us where we need to go, even though we have no idea where that might be. When we surrender to the present moment, we suspend our need for trust and assurance. We pull the paddles in and accept the wisdom of the now. It is when we allow ourselves to truly experience what comes in the moment that something special happens. Some say that this could be described as being in the zone or the flow experience. To me, this is a form of grace, which I would describe as leaning into the wisdom of the universe. I would like to close with a favorite poem of mine from Rumi that reflects the mixed joy of living, living in this moment. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you, Susan. We'll now virtually receive our offering. Namakwa walks our talk by sharing our plate with a local nonprofit or some other way to enhance our community that we care much about and that shares our values. And in this time when Mobile Laundry, which is our chosen half plate recipient this quarter, um, is out of commission for the moment, we're giving our money to laundry vouchers so that people who are homeless can be safe and clean. And so Sarah has put in your chat box a button to donate and you're free to donate by bank. You can transfer from your bank account or you can also now pay by credit card. And so I'll give you a minute to do that. You can also find the donate button on our website or of course mail in money to the church. And so let me just provide a little bit of Native American flute music to inspire your generosity. We dedicate ourselves and these are our offerings to the vision of this congregation, which is to radiate love, peace, and justice 
as together we work to build beloved community. Thank you. All of us are artists. Whether we think of ourselves that way or not, we're all artists composing the story of our own lives. And many of us are artists in what we think of as more traditional forms of art, painting, gardening, singing, pottery, journaling, woodworking. And I wonder if any of you now in this time of staying at home are having more time to be creative. I know that some of you are dabbing back into your art of painting. I know that I'm doing a lot more reading and writing, playing the piano, and as I mentioned earlier, taking time to memorize poetry. And maybe we're wondering about who we are called to be in this time. I envision the art of creation as a dance, as a dance between what may be called the masculine and feminine types of creation. And I do not mean these terms to have anything to do with gender, but as a way to kind of characterize the energy. And all of us, regardless of how we define gender, have the capacity to use both kinds of energy to create. The masculine way to create is to rely on our minds, our reason. And it's the way that most of us were taught to choose something that we want, to set a goal, a clear intention, and then do whatever it takes to actively achieve that goal. The feminine, on the other hand, instead of relying on reason and mind and doing, has more to do with feelings, on intuition, and our internal compass, maybe that still quiet voice within is our guiding star. And in the dance of what I'll call the third way, we can use both the feminine and masculine ways to create. And in this third way, there is an element of surrender, of letting go and trusting that the next step will appear when we need it. You know, surrendering is often thought of as a form of weakness, of failure, that we're being too passive. And I think most of us are reluctant to admit when we don't have control, even though, as Susan said, control is to a great extent an illusion. And it's hard for us to admit when someone asks a question that our answer is, I don't know. But the truth is that surrender isn't failure. And in reality, it often takes more strength and courage than fighting, than refusing to let go. And as I've been thinking about this, it took me back to one morning many years ago when I was waiting to hear whether I had been admitted to Star King School for the Ministry to get my Master's in Divinity. So I was having breakfast with one of my friends who was reading my application and my letters of reference. My friend was a fierce activist. And when she came to the phrase in one of my letters of reference, she was incensed. The phrase was something like, I'm pleased that Laurel finally submitted to her call to Unitarian Universalist Ministry. My friend said, submit? Unitarian Universalists don't submit? That's like giving up, like being beaten down and we're kneeling on our knees. We're fighters. Unitarian Universalists don't give up. And it's true, when I look at our UU principles and look at some of the hymns in our hymn book, I don't see any reference to surrender. And yet, I 
felt that that characterization of submitting to my call to ministry was accurate. For many reasons and for many years, I fought a call to ministry. And now that I had submitted and I had decided to take the next step and go to seminary, I felt a tremendous sense of relief and of anticipation. And now I was just wondering some questions that I still flirt with, which is who is calling me and what am I being called to do and to be? And I wonder if any of you wrestle with these basically theological questions. If you feel called to create a certain work of art or feel called to do something or be something perhaps different than who you are right now, who's calling you? And how do you discern what you're being called to do? There's a Sufi story that I have recounted I think probably several times in the years that I've been with you, but I find myself returning to it again and again. It's the story about a little stream that's flowing down a mountain and makes its way all the way through the mountain to a desert. And when it comes to the desert, its water keeps seeping down and disappearing into the sand. But that little stream feels that its destiny lies on the other side of the desert. And so one day, the story goes, that little stream gave itself to the wind and the wind picked it up and carried it over the desert and then dropped on the other side as rain. This morning, I offer you this story as an example of the mysterious power of surrender. The little stream couldn't reach the other side of the desert on its own, and it wouldn't be able to make any further progress towards its destiny until it gave itself to the wind. It submitted, surrendered to the wind. And so one of the profound questions that this story raises is, what is the wind? I heard this story preached by a Christian minister who asked us Unitarian Universalists, what is our wind? For Christians, it's Jesus Christ and the resurrection that was so recently celebrated with those who celebrate Easter. But Unitarian Universalism, although we have Christian roots, doesn't have the same wind necessarily as Christians do. And so in your personal life, what is your wind? What is it? The energy that carries you, that helps you be creative and create your life and the works of art that may flow from you. And I think flow is the key. The Becky Reardon song talked about letting it flow. And Susan, in her reflection, talked about the flow. Any of you who have been what's called in the zone know that it is a wonderful feeling to be in the flow of surrendering to the inherently mysterious spiritual heart of creativity. Surrendering to the creative process I see is a little bit like a trust fall. A trust fall is when you might close your eyes and risk falling back, trusting that the group of friends or people behind you will catch you. And so surrendering is like a trust fall. And what may be surprising about surrender is that once we do, once we give up what Susan calls our illusion of control, we may experience that sense of ease, that sense of relief that I described when I submitted to my call to ministry. And as much as we're conditioned to never give up, 
it actually allows us, if we surrender, to be fully present to now, to the current moment. So take a minute and just breathe and feel where you are. You might be holding your new puppy. You might be sitting comfortably. You might be ready for the service to be over so that you can chat or run to the bathroom. But whatever that reality is, that is all we have is now. And surrendering and letting go of the illusion of control is one of the best ways to be in the present moment. And I want to close with a poem that is about letting go. It's by a woman named Sapphire Rose. She let go. Without a thought or a word, she let go. She let go of fear. She let go of the judgments. She let go of the confluence of opinions swarming around her head. She let go of the committee of indecision within her. She let go of all the quote unquote right reasons, whole and completely without hesitation or worry, she let go. She didn't ask anyone for advice. She didn't read a book on how to let go. She didn't search the scriptures. She just let go. She let go of all the anxiety that kept her from moving forward. She let go of the planning and all of the calculations about how to do it just right. She didn't journal about it. She didn't write the projected date in her day timer. She didn't check the weather report or read her daily horoscope. She just let go. She didn't analyze whether she should let go. Like a leaf falling from a tree, she just let go. There was no effort. There was no struggle. It wasn't good and it wasn't bad. It was when it was and it is just that. In the space of letting go, she let all be. A small smile came over her face and a light breeze blew, blew through her. A light breeze blew through her. So ah, that breeze, that fresh and cool breeze of letting go. And our closing song is one that I've often done, Call and Response. And this version of it is sung by Plum Village, which as many of you may know, is the home of Thich Nhat Hanh. And so please feel free to sing along. Sarah will project the lyrics. And if you don't know it, please just enjoy the words and the melody. And when I rise,
And now it's time to extinguish our chalice. As we extinguish the chalice of the flame of our chalice, may we remember what the Buddha said. In the end, these things matter most. How well did you love? How fully did you love? How deeply did you learn to let go? May we give ourselves to loving as well and as fully as we can. And when we come to that place where we need to let go, may we know that the deepest of all loves will be waiting to catch us. May it be so. The deepest of all loves, meaning that grace, that mysterious heart of creativity. You're familiar, I'm sure, with Reinhold Niebuhr's serenity prayer. This is about the dance. Grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Before we do our closing song, the UU Blessing Song, I'd like to invite you to stick around for a while if you'd like after the service. What Sarah will do is send you an invitation to go to a chat room. And then I'm hoping that many of you will agree to give feedback during the music feedback session. And if you are, then type your name and Sarah will take you from the break room into what I'll call the music feedback room, which is where Sally Henry, our chair of the Committee on Shared Ministry, will facilitate a conversation looking back at this year of an experiment where we had a music committee and looking forward to what we'll do in 2020, 2021, our new church year that begins on July 1st. So thank you all for being here this morning. You are beautiful. And so now our closing song. It's a blessing you were born. It's a blessing. Don't have 